OK, so uh, thank thank you for hello. Sorry, just there was a bit of a delay in it starting there. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining today. Um, I see we've got a couple of attendees still joining or moving in. So if we'll just bear with me for a couple of moments um, and then we'll start with the webinar. OK, we'll just give it another, another minute or so and see if there's a few more attendees come in and then we'll uh, we'll get started. OK, so I'll, uh, first, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Neil Fitzgibbon. I'm the Optics Metrology Business Development Manager here at Taylor Hobson. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining this uh, this webinar this afternoon or this morning, or depending on your location. Um, so today, um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Mark Vendel. Um, he's the Opti Optics Applications Manager within the metrology, optics and metrology group at Taylor Hobson. Um, he's been with Taylor Hobson for six years, just over. Um, although he was working in metrology for a substantial amount of time before that, so he has, he has lots of metrology experience. But obviously in the last six years, he's really specialised in the LUFA scan uh, and the support of the LUFA scan. So uh, I think what you'll find is a very, in the next few uh, slides, you'll find it to be a very interesting an informative webinar. So I'd like to hand you over to Mark now, who can start with the webinar. OK, I think it's just taking a moment to think about it. If you bear with us. Yeah, yeah hello. Well, thank you for the uh, nice introduction, Neil. Today, I will talk about the uh, LUFO scan ranges, and give a short introduction. Yeah, this is me. Neil already told you I'm senior applications manager of the German Taylor Hobson team situated in Weiterstadt, close to Darmstadt and Frankfurt. And I will tell you a little bit about optics and the LUFO scan systems. As a short motivation, um, I've got this slide here. You see uh, lots of applications here. And uh, yeah, everybody knows that the uh, requirements and demands in the devices are growing. For example, in the consumer market for classical cameras, smartphone cameras, AR and VR goggles, but also in automotive uh, sections where you get lots of cameras and the quality of the cameras is increasing too. We've got the uh, industries, uh, for example, uh, for molding process of contact lenses. So the quality of these parts is increasing too, although the costs are very low. And last but not least, also the research and development. One example here are telescope mirrors or telecommunication optics. So the demands in each of these areas are growing. Uh, second thing um, everybody is aware of is that time is money, so the cycle time is important uh, for all measurements and all products, and therefore also the flexibility. So you've got uh, fastly changing products, so the optics are also changing very fast. You've got different sizes, you've got uh, different forms, uh, sphericity is changing too, so you need a flexible device to cover all these demands. Taylor Hobson in principle offers uh, two approaches. One is the uh, tactile approach, so you're doing a single trace or a raster scan uh, with a diamond tip, for example, over the surface. So this is a very fast uh, way to measure the surface and you've got a high cost efficiency, and it's also an extremely robust system to measure optics. 
But today we will talk about the non-contact metrology. This is uh, especially for uh, 3D uh, acquisition of form errors. And as an optical system, like an interferometer, we have the highest available precision. Yeah, as said, today non-contact metrology is the topic. We will start with some theory about the multi-wavelength interferometry and then go over to the Lufus scan systems, the idea and the theory of operations. And then I will also show some applications where the Lufus scan system is used. Okay, theory. When you think of a uh, point distance measurement probe, then uh, you usually use an interferometer, so you use a laser beam, but the disadvantage of a one single wavelength you see here is that you only have the accuracy, uh, the um, absolute measurement range of half a wavelength while you have a good accuracy. When you want to overcome this disadvantage, you can use, for example, several wavelengths. Here's an example with two wavelengths shown. So they are slightly different. And with these slightly different wavelengths, we can calculate a synthetic beat wavelength. And this speed wavelength gives us a uh, very large absolute measurement range. And at the same time, we still have the high accuracy of the standard interferometers. And as we are using several interferometers measuring the same distance, the accuracy is even better and the system is more robust. Yeah, the properties of these uh, multi-wavelength interferometers are uh, shown here. Of course, it's an interferometer, so it's a non-contact system. We've got an extremely high accuracy of better than two nanometers. And uh, we have a large working distance and a large working range of several dozens of centimeters. And at the same time, as seen before by the synthetic beat wavelength, we've got a very high absolute measurement range, which is in our case 1.25 millimeters. And you can also interrupt the beam, and when you release it, you absolutely know where you are on the surface. Our technology allows us to uh, measure different types of surfaces and materials, so we can have transparent materials, specular, polished, or rough surfaces. And as we are evaluating the phase and not the intensity, we are not sensitive to the intensity, so it can be a highly reflective or low reflective surface that can be measured. Here you see a sketch of the setup of a multi-probe system. So we have the four wavelength we are typically using. We couple them to one fiber, and then we split the fiber to the several probes. In this example, we've got four probes. Each probe generates its own reference and measures the distance. The signal goes back and is rerouted, split it into the four wavelengths, and then all four probes with each four wavelengths are separate, uh, evaluated at the same time. Yeah, the uh, system, as you see in the sketch here, is uh, totally based on fiber optics, so it's very robust. You can also bend the fibers and it's still uh, stable. As I said, we're using four wavelengths in the range of 1.5 to 1.6 microns. The absolute uh, measurement interval is 1.25 millimeters. And here you see a picture of a single probe, which is uh, quite small, only 80 millimeters in diameter and 38 millimeters in total length. And they are manufactured uh, or made wholly of invar, so they are thoroughly stable. And these probes are used in the Lufus scan system for them. And yeah, the Lufus scan system is a turnkey solution to measure different types of surfaces, starting from flats or spheres, deep spheres. You can measure A-spheres, convex or concave, also with inflection points. 
you can measure free forms, cylinders, A cylinders, uh, you can measure surfaces with small steps like ferrodiffractive surfaces, you can measure Fresnel lenses, so large steps on the surface, you can measure interrupted surfaces like this uh, D-shaped or uh, stripe-shaped uh, lens, you can also measure lenses with holes or a central hole, that's all no problem to measure with the LUFO scan system. The background idea of the system was uh, to combine the advantages of two worlds. One world was the uh, tactile measurement with a great geometric flexibility. And the second world was the interferometric world, so the non-contact and high accuracy measurement. And we just came up with the LUFO scan, which is a scanning interferometer based on an optical point sensor. Yeah, here you see a very old picture of one of the first systems. You see the axis layout. We've got one air bearing spindle rotating the object and one linear stage moving the sensor group left and right, one linear stage moving the sensor group up and down and an additional rotary stage to tilt the sensor. Like this, we are able to move the object probe this one over the surface following the design shape of the lens, equidistant and normal. And while we are doing this and rotating the object, we are doing a spiral scan on the surface and get a full 3D map of the uh, actual target comparison. On top right, uh, you see a small video illustrating the uh, spiral skin over the surface. So you see we are scanning perpendicular to the surface and equidistant and covering the full surface. Of course, when you want to measure a nanometer scale, you can't just rely on the accuracy of the stages. So what we are using is a reference frame, the blue one in this picture here, made of Inva, and we attached uh, some mirrors to this, one on this side and one mirror on top. And like this, we can use a reference probe to track the distance in radial direction while we are scanning over the surface. Another reference probe is tracking the uh, vertical distance to this mirror while we are scanning over the surface. And as said before, we are measuring perpendicular to the surface, so we have to tilt this probe. And the run out of, run out of the tilt stage is measured, referenced by this probe to a cylindrical mirror. With this setup, when you look at the red lines or the blue lines, we are exactly following the Abel principle. Um, just to explain explain why this is so important. One slide here. You see a comparison of a caliper to an outside micrometer. When you look at the caliper, you're measuring diameter or the length here and the scale is here. But if you're measuring a different part and you push the, uh, the caliper hard, then you see that you get a wrong result because there's a tilt on the caliper and you're getting a wrong result. So the caliper is violating the Abel principle because the distance you want to measure is not in the same plane as the scale. The outside micrometer, in contrast, is uh, used for measuring the same length, but now the distance we want to measure is in the same plane as the scale, so we don't have any first order errors and the Abel principle is followed 100%. And I think it's quite obvious that a um, system that is obeying the Apple principle has a much better maximum accuracy than a system that is violating the Apple principle. Okay, this is uh, the theory so far. Here we come to the hardware. You see a picture of three Lufo scan systems. So the, let's call it standard sizes from 120, 260, to 420. The numbers 
are giving the maximum measurable diameter of the surface. So here the standard 120 to 420. We also got larger systems measuring 600 and up to 850 millimeters in diameter. And we also got a smaller system, uh, especially for the smartphone camera market that is only able to measure 50 millimeters maximum. Yeah, some uh, numbers about accuracy for the smallest system, the SL, the 50 SL, we've got an absolute PV form accuracy uh, that we specify of 30 nanometers in a three sigma interval up to 30 degrees. 70 nanometers up to 70 degrees and 100 nanometers up to 90 degrees. Uh, please be aware that these numbers are just positive numbers, so there's no plus minus because the PV is always a positive number. Below here you see the uh, repeatability of the PV. We specify only a few nanometers, 3 to 10 nanometers up to 90 degrees. And yeah, to prove these numbers, uh, I brought you two examples. One you see here, this table is uh, five measurements, a series of five measurements of a calibration ball with one inch diameter approximately, and we measure this ball up to 90 degrees, so really a hemisphere. And you see the PV three sigma deviation is only two and a half nanometers. So the real life uh, deviation or uncertainty is typically much better than what we specify. On the right hand side you see another graph. Uh, this is a repeat measurement over 13 hours. You see in red the power and in blue the PV value and you see that over more than half a day the stability is perfect. So we still stay in a band of approximately plus minus 10 nanometers over 13 hours without any recalibration. Yeah, also uh, I mentioned the cycle time during the motivation. Um, typically for a standard object of a Lufus Scan 260 system, we have a setup time and setup and measurement time, so both together of less than eight minutes. When we uh, look again at the example uh, I explained before, the calibration ball, one inch measured up to 90 degrees, measurement time is only six and a half minutes. So the eight minutes is really a realistic time. Yeah, the flexibility of the system is uh, very good. So you don't need any uh, hardware setup time, don't need any hardware changes. You just type the uh, aspheric equation or the coefficients of the aspheric equation to the software and you can do the next measurement. And the sphericity is unlimited, so we can measure everything from sphere to an A-sphere, Galwing A-sphere, segmented parts, uh, refractive Fresnel, anything you can think of. Yeah, here are some examples. Um, as I said, Flat spheres and eight spheres can be measured. There's no limitation to sphericity. For convex parts, we can measure up to 90 degrees slope. For concave parts, we can measure up to 85 degrees. For small parts with a few millimeters in diameter, for larger parts, uh, the uh, concave angle is limited to approximately 65 degrees. And yeah, here you see some examples, something that is almost spheric, an A-sphere, another simple A-sphere. Here's something that can't be measured with a standard interferometer, for example. For Lufus scan, it's just a trivial task. So it's a so-called pancake lens, flat in the central area and then a steep slope at the edge. Or here, a so-called Galwing A-sphere or an A-sphere with inflection points. It's just typing the coefficients to the software and click on the start button. Here I've got an example video of a measurement of a quite large A sphere. It's a diameter of 75 millimeters. 
and a surface slope of maximum uh, 63 degrees. And the measurement time is only five and a half, five and a half minutes. And you see here again how we are measuring. The object is rotating and we are moving equidistant and perpendicular to the surface following the design shape. Yeah, and that's the full measurement. Yeah, the uh, Lufo scan system is scalable, so you can uh, use the system to measure very small lenses of one millimeter diameter or less like smartphone camera lenses you see here this one at approximately four millimeters in diameter you can measure standard classical lenses uh, in the range of 10 20 up to 100 millimeters but also it's possible to measure large samples with 300 millimeters or this mirror with 650 millimeters and uh, at the moment up to 850 millimeters is possible with our systems Apart from size, there are always uh, lots of different special tasks that need to be measured. So, for example, you can have an, an, a stripe uh, type of lens or D cut or any segmented part of lens that can be measured. You can have an, a hole in the center. You can also measure uh, Exicon, so with any angle from flat uh, to 90 degrees, so a cylinder can also be negative, so a concave exicon. That's also possible. We can also measure the uh, steps uh, on surfaces, like a spherodiffractive sample you see here. So here you see the raw data, including the steps. So we're measuring the sample as it would be in a sample without any steps. And then we are removing the steps in post-processing. This has been done here. For a Fresnel lens, 50 millimeters in diameter, and I think there are more than 200 zones on this lens. And on the right-hand side, you see the results where the step heights of the design are already removed in post-processing. Yeah, uh, although the system had been designed for rotational symmetric optics, we are also able to measure freeform optics like uh, shallow aspheric or spheric cylinders. We can measure polynomial freeforms like this one. Uh, you also see the, the, uh, some lines here. This is from the manufacturing process, which had been a linear process. And you also see a small scratch on the bottom right here. So you see all the information you want to have from a freeform surface too. <clears throat> but uh, you're not limited to small uh, freeforms. You can also measure large freeforms up to 850 millimeters. Here's an example uh, of a freeform that is also segmented and has a diameter of approximately 320 millimeters, so quite large freeform. And here on top you see a proof of concept. So we used a uh, calibration ball, a one inch ball uh, you've seen before, and we measured it centered, so as a totally rotational symmetric part, and then we off-centered it, so it is a freeform for our system. And when you compare the two images, you also see the uh, small structures here. So you really see it's the same result for a centered and as a free form. We can also acquire additional information uh, of a lens. For example, the uh, correlation of top and bottom surface. So we can get the uh, wedge error, the tilt of top and bottom surface. We can get the decenter of top and bottom surface and also the thickness of a lens for, let's say, classical lenses from 10 to 70, 80 millimeters in diameter. We use an uh, additional hardware extension where the lens is fixed and measured for 
the smartphone camera lens, so small and thin samples. Um, we are doing it uh, even more elegant by measuring through the lens. So first we are measuring the, the top surface and then we're doing several circles on the back side of the lens and then correlate the two informations. Using this uh, approach, we can also uh, correlate the optical surface of a sample or a tool to mechanical reference. Here shown for a molding tool for smartphone camera lenses. So we measure the optical surface and then just an example, we can measure a cylindrical surface on the tool so we can correlate the optical surface to the mount of the tool. This also works for uh, lenses. So we can have some uh, so-called interlocks or um, reference surfaces owned by the object that can be measured, that can be flats, that can be on the outer diameter, that can be tilted surfaces. So you can measure rings, uh, surfaces, you can get the uh, PV, you can get the centration and uh, tilts, and also the roundness, for example. And there are many, many, many more tasks that can be done, but uh, all of these tasks just shown here very, very quickly, very quickly uh, will be covered by some following, following webinars we will do in the following weeks. You can find them on the Taylor Hobson webpage soon. And yeah, at this point, uh, I'm coming to the end and I'll just summarize. So we have seen uh, at the beginning that we have increasing requirements on the metrology systems because the uh, demands in the optical systems of many products are increasing too. And then we talked about the theory and uh, the working principle of the LUFO scan. And I showed you lots of um, examples of measurements and uh, special tasks. And uh, yeah, I guess you, you've seen that the LUFO scan covers lots of different applications in one single device, from standard surface measurements up to special tasks. So to name it in one, bullet point, the LUFO scan stands for precision, flexibility and speed. Yeah, this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A window and I will answer them now. Thank you. Neil, you are muted. Thank you very much, Mark. There's always a little technical hitch that goes on. OK, I'll start again. Thank you very much uh, for the Mark for, for that, that excellent webinar. Um, that was very informative. Um, going further, if anybody has any questions based on what Mark's talked about that you know that you don't think of now, then feel free to contact us via the Taylor Hobson website or via your local sales uh, engineers. Um, as Mark mentioned, coming up in the, the forthcoming weeks, we have a series of optics webinars that will be covering everything from special applications on the PGI through to more specialist applications and how to measure maybe advanced things like free forms and things like that on the LUFA scan. So feel free to check out the Taylor Hobson website for future webinars. Thank you again very much, Mark, and thank you to all those of you that have joined us. Goodbye.